everybody, how you guys doing? This is Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, here with D.W. McCann. And welcome to our current episode of Table Talk. I know we're starting the music out really, really slow until I find something a little more high energy, but until then, I would say sit back, relax, and prep to actually get excited about some stuff because we are not quiet people. Uh, how you doing today, D.W.? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. It's been uh, a good start to the year so far. Yeah, well, I, that's good for one of us. But we're getting a late start today. So, mm -hmm. you know, we are just going, we are going to be as professional as possible in getting through this. And we're not, <laughs> not going to be wandering. I know in prep for today's episode, we talked about nine or ten different things that had nothing to do with gaming. Just a bunch of old men talking about why, why modern day cheesy movies are ass and how great <laughs> Rush is. <laughs> yes. But good topics for another podcast. <laughs> it just wouldn't have fit with this particular Well, we need podcast. longer beards and canes so we can be like, back in my day, we had the ghoulies and when there were puppets coming out of uh, out of, out of toilets. No, no. If you're going to go there, you got to go critters. Yeah, exactly. Come on. Back critters in my over day. Ghoulies. Critters over ghoulies. I always wanted to see a freaking grudge match between critters and popples. That's all I'm saying, you know. Yeah, that's right. I, I Welcome to Nostalgia actually, Land. Uh, I think critters are popples, like the evil version. Well, yeah, the, the they evil, ate after they midnight. They all have the goatee because they're from the alternate oh, evil no, universe. They were all just popples that were fed after midnight, <laughs> and every, everything went no, terrible. No, because there was no stripe. Huh? Which the one I laughed about with with Gremlins was the fact that he went from he was Stripe in the first movie and Mohawk in the second, but he recognized him in as being the same person, I even though he changed the name. But he died at the end of part one. I mean, that. But that I, I think what they were trying to suggest is that they the same one can come back. Um, maybe. I mean, I you know if you take Gremlins as an archetype, uh, archetypal thing, but. That sounds a lot like a Hydea conversation, and since I don't smoke weed, this is not one that'll get, uh, not a conversation that'll get, that's right, I don't smoke weed, what? Jeez, I'm like this regularly. I do. Yeah, he smokes it for me, <laughs> so does the henchman, you know, but, um, so yeah, last, last week, um, or last episode, rather, we left off with our top five movies that we were looking forward to, and of course... You know, I almost had to throw some hands about the Black Panther not being your number one. But that's okay. As long as it's one of our number ones, I it, keep it my black my person list. credit. It is also on my top list. <laughs> it just isn't my number one. I get you. I get you. I'm, I'm kind of waiting to see Infinity War. Avengers Warfare. isn't what beat it out either. Yeah, so. I know. I know. But there's a lot of people out there that are just like, oh, no. Black Panther looks cool and everything, but I can't insert myself into the main character's yeah. shoes. So. No, no. That, is, that is not the case. Yeah, so. I'm, I am fully in support. Let me put it this way. There have been plenty of movies I could not insert myself into the character's shoes, and I'm okay with that. Uh, I do not need to feel that the story has to every time be about somebody I could be. Um, because that's that's a little self That makes you rare, you know. But I'm not going to lie. I try – I'm again, I, I talk to a lot of people about how I'm third – I'm third – POV omnipotent when I watch movies because of my lack of self insertion. Um, but don't get me wrong, uh, I could rock the Wonder Woman outfit. I I, I could rock I those don't boots. Ever want to be there for that? Hmm? Are you kidding? I don't, don't want to be there. For You're that. gonna have your mandolin going. I don't know how I got, I got put into agreeing that I'm gonna learn that song just so I can play it while you wear the outfit. See what happens I think when I lost you protest a bet or something. See what happens when you protest. <laughs> Bid P is not a democracy. Actually, it is. It's just there's only one vote that counts. Anyway, um, and that's the counter of the vote. This vote counts. Um, but today on Table Talk, we are going to talk about games, mm -hmm. okay? Um, because we wanted to get to the top five of each last time, but you and me just cannot have a quick conversation. <laughs> it, is, it is not possible. It is why we are friends, because we are both verbose, verbose. And though brevity is the soul of wit and outward arms sometimes flourishes, we cannot be brief. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, so it's too much meat to our conversation. There really is a whole lot of meat, and since you're Irish, I got to bring up the potatoes, and yeah, since yeah. I'm black, you're gonna but, have to bring up the yams. No, no, see, um, see, there's, there's specifically to a carnivore, there is three food groups. Mm -hmm. There is meat, there is near meat, and there is what meat eats. 
If you eat too much <laughs> from the third category, you become the first category. Ah, okay. But near meat is potatoes, anything that goes well with meat. As a matter of fact, there was a whole conversation that was had about whether ice cream was a near meat. And then we decided, but it's in, in time, it's near meat. You wouldn't eat it next to a steak, but you'd eat it shortly after one. Okay, so you guys are meat. weird. When I think carnivores, I think like animals. So like the three stages of meat are like running, injured, and in my mouth. I mean, that's that's pretty much what I get. No, there's you know? seasonings. Hmm? There's always seasonings. Seasonings you know? ain't meat. <laughs> but but that's the thing is I'm a carnivore who likes to season my meat and have near meat with it. It's that third category you mean that I identify omnivore? is food. No, no, it's that third category that I identify is food. But not my food. <laughs> okay. All right. I get that. I, I totally get that. See, I'm like a balanced eater because I'm a biped who has like, well, okay, I've got terrible teeth now. But there was a time where I had teeth in my head that were designed to chew various different things. So sometimes I can grind my leafy things and other times I could pierce meat and other times I can, I can chew and cut and grime things that were neither meat nor plant but something hideous and unholy from betwixt the twain that man should not know called called hostess but um but yeah so again we're talking games yes games no more bits no more jokes <laughs> look at the sign it says oh, stop trying to be funny there will be more bits there will be more <laughs> jokes just we're okay. gonna get on to games yeah exactly uh, exactly so and um, if you guys want to join in on this conversation, you can't because this is pre-recorded. But if you want to start a conversation with us, then feel free to hit us up at backinthedeck at gmail.com. You can also hit us on the Twitter with Twitter backslash um, back in the deck or bid P. We're talking Instagram slash um, bid P because I want to see what your faces look like since you're used to looking at us. I want to see what you look like and say, man that is a handsome man or that is a hot hot chick or that person if i were 20 years younger i would so be thinking about talking to them and then staying in the corner quietly because i'm a <laughs> nerd um you can also hit us up on the soundcloud now soundcloud is super special because that is the number one platform where you can download the audio from everything that we do and it's free and it's legal. You won't get flagged. So it's not pirating. It's us saying, dude, if you like listening to what we have to say and you like feeling like you're hanging out with us when you're driving or in the shower. Okay, in the shower's a little weird. But if you're driving or if you're at work or, you know, if you just, if you're cooking and cleaning and don't have time to watch but you want to listen, download us to your phone, play us out of your Bluetooth speaker, that kind of thing. You can do that for free at your leisure. So feel free to hit us up there. Or if you want to talk to us directly, specifically me, then you have to join the Deckers on the Book Facebook group. I'm on that too. Yeah. Oh, you're on that? Okay. But see, do you check it every two hours? Not every two hours. Now, of course not, because you actually have a life outside of this channel. <laughs> um, but if you want to talk to myself, you want to talk to DW, you want to talk to any of the other henchmen or co-hosts, or just some of the other people like you who think we are full of crap, then... Look up Deckers on the book on Facebook. That is on the Facebook and talk to the other Deckers. Now, the Patreon is still down. We're having a lot of technical stuff. But just know that the website is coming up soon. The Patreon is coming up soon. And, um, yeah, so let us know about that. So on to our topic for today. Um, top five. No ties. No ties. No honorable mentions nope. because... You know, I really hate the whole honorable mention thing on like top 10 lists because mm -hmm. it's like, here are our top 10, but here are some honorable mentions really making this like the top 11 or 12, but you won't click on it if it's the top, if it's the top 11 or 12. Well, I'm also, I'm kind of tired of, of uh, clickbait. Yeah. Well, you know, I can't say that I'm trying Especially, to make a living off of it, but. Well, no, no, but that, no, clickbait is when you give a topic and then you don't really present that topic or especially the one that's got me now is is and i won't i just won't click through anything that does uh each page is one item so oh. if we've got a list of 10 i'm gonna put 15 ads on this page and if you want to see number two you have to click to another Next 15 page. yeah ads. yeah you, you lost me that's we'll see. i saw one and i went back yeah I, I try i try and memorize a lot of the sites that do that because um i'm normally checking these lists on my phone 
and I'm like, okay, the, oh, great, a thing that popped up on YouTube, but this actually, or not YouTube, but on Facebook, this looks like some useful information. Click, here's the introduction to the page. Okay, okay, okay. Wait, this is a top 10 list and this is page one of 11? Nope, you know, <laughs> that's that's what I do. Yep. Um, the only, the clickbait that I find funny, but I'm kind of learning to read is the stuff on YouTube where it's like, why this ruined everything, or this thing is the worst and will tell you why. And I'm like, you know, I liked it enough, so I disagree. Moving on. Ooh, a History Channel documentary. You know, that, that was the thing in the news for so long is, what's larger than a bread box and possibly killing you while it exists in your kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I, I remember a lot of those articles or those newscasts when I was a kid. You know, it's like, this is the hot new toy that might castrate your children. Film at 11. And then 11, well, you're really like watching it. I know that now because my kid's currently playing with something and could be that thing. Yeah, no, they're not running that particular story. Yeah, we weren't story. on the 24-7 news cycle. Yeah, yet. but back then it was like they would open with that. And then you're like, all right, I got to stay up to watch the 11 o'clock news. And that story, the one they knew you turned in on, is the last freaking segment on a one-hour news show. Yep. In the meantime, it's like death, death, homeless, death, no, recession, no, depression. No, you no, know? we're going to give a recap of a TV show that... That if you really liked, you would have watched anyways. Yeah. But we're going to make the news recap that TV show for you. And when we come back, the next five fashion trends of next season. And what's bigger than a bread box and probably castrating your children right now. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, so we're not doing that top five list. Mm -hmm. What we're doing are the top five games that we're looking forward to playing next um, over the next year. Now, this is important, okay, because... Here are our criteria, ladies and gentlemen, because you guys are going to want to throw your stuff in there, too. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be a new game. It doesn't have to come out in 2017. But this is the... 2018. Yeah, 20, no, 2018. Yeah, this is the list of um, our New Year's resolutions for before Christmas, we going to play these games. These are the games that we're going to play. And, you know, we if for some reason we haven't gotten around to buying them... Um, or they just came out and they look interesting, or we've had them and can't find anyone to play with, but we're going to this year by my rod and staff. I will play this game. So um, I'm going to start with you, DW, because I've been talking for the past 15 minutes. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> uh, well, number five on my list, and I just got introduced to the game last year, but I want to uh, play it more. I want to, I'm really looking forward because it's an ongoing storyline game called Time Stories. Okay. And essentially it's one of those games where uh, your actions in this current game are supposed to carry over to the next chapter. You'll get perks and whatever in the next version if you do well in this version. Or if people die in this version, the next one will be a little harder. And I really like that idea of an ongoing board game that uh, the challenge gets increased as you play. The only problem is uh, lack of playability uh, for a second time or third time. Gotcha. Because you now know the tricks that are going on. You know what you were supposed to try and figure out. Yeah, and that is one of those weird type things because when I get a board game or any kind of game, I need the maximum bang for my buck. Maximum bang. Because, um, you know, board games nowadays, they cost an average of about 60 bucks each one. So a board game or a top tier video game cost about the same. So replayability is a big thing. Yeah. You know, especially since a board game takes up way more space than a CD. So, <laughs> But if you are only playing it once, then you don't necessarily need to keep it around. Uh, for me, it, it, the difference is whether or not the replayability is uh, something like if there, there are games where you're supposed to write on the board or destroy a portion of the board if that's how the game goes. Okay. And that's not only not playable again for me, that means nobody can play this again. Yeah. This board is now dedicated to the game I am playing. Yeah. And I'm not as fond of that. I know Pandemic uh, was doing stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, this one in particular, you could decide that you want to play it again, but you're going to let other people who've never played it kind of be the decision makers. Right. And so you're just going to kind of go along with them. So in that sense, it feels a lot more like the modules that we would get for D&D. Okay. Where you'd buy that story. And once you know that story, you know that the dragon is actually going to be the homeless guy yeah. that you encountered in the first village. And you're going to pretend that you don't know that as you take new people. Or you'll run right. it yourself. Yeah. or And when you run it yourself, you're going to make alterations so that mm -hmm. you're running a module inspired by the module that you bought. 
Yeah, so. you can. And with time stories, you can as much. At least I have not been able to figure out. If you figure it out, please send me messages on how to do that. But I've not figured out a way to adapt it so that it would be new for me. Okay. Um, I, I'm open to ideas of, of, to find more playability. But I've, I've only played the first story. We did uh, horribly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it is the, the first story had one path that if you take that path, it will absorb all of your time. And so we okay. ran out of time. Um, so I, I kind of want to play it again, knowing that I shouldn't go that direction and see if I get, but, it, but having already played it, I know how that ends. So it's not going to be the same. All right. So I'm looking forward to playing the second chapter though. We have some, uh, some challenges going in, having failed the first one. Gotcha. Okay. How about you? What's your number five? My number five is an RPG expansion. Um, based and i want to get this so i can either play it on a d20 system or adapt it to some other role-playing system i got but reaching back to my deep cut nerddom john carter of mars there's nice. a john carter of mars example not just the stupid sci-fi movie that was starring the first guy to play dario no harris on game of thrones it was a book series in the 1920s i believe i still and, like, yeah it was, it, it's a very old book series. yeah and it but i still liked the movie i'm one of the few who actually enjoyed the movie i just had to separate it from the books well i i almost like the movie the movie got the movie got a low straight from me i mean it it, it, it was okay see it in theaters because the special effects of that level deserve theatrical um theatrical viewing kind of like valerian and much like valerian it was okay yeah, i guess it valerian. looks good but it it's not very nourishing um john carter of mars was you know it was pretty much action adventure but oh. i like the whole idea of the old 1920s through 1950s serials of you know now we all know i love superheroes I love, love superheroes, but there was a section of time with science fiction from H.G. Wells to about the 1970s where you got a guy and then a thing happens and he has to be the hero in a different society, be it um, Flash, um, Gordon. Flash Gordon, uh, I was thinking the time machine from H.G. Wells, time machine, absolutely. you know, John Carter of Mars, um, Buck well, Rogers. I would say with, with, with time machine, though, the only reason why I wouldn't put that in the category is he was also like pretty much a super genius. He was, he was a, not an average guy where John Carter was a little bit more average guy. OK, yeah, it, it's true. H.G. Wells um, was in the time machine. He was a super genius who made a time machine. But he ended up going against like a yet another subterranean barbarian race. And it didn't really show in the in the story his intelligence being the thing that got him out of that. Yes, true. Okay. Well, as a matter of fact, I felt like a, a lot of the story was him having to break the the intelligence uh, right. barrier that he was just relying on in his world. Right. He had to be physical. He had to be active. It, it, exactly to that. Outside of his comfort level. Yeah. I'll and so, that. like, I'll you know, that. that's why yeah. it's on that list. So yeah, you've got sure. like the time machine. Um, John Carter of Mars is another one, of course, because that's the game that we're talking about. <laughs> um, yeah. Flash Gordon is the most famous, not to mention Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a guy. Now that guy is fish out of water. Hey, now that guy has to be the hero. If you you're know? going to bring up Buck Rogers, you have to bring up Duck Dodgers in the 23rd and a half century <laughs> as well. You know that Daffy is my favorite Warner guy, <laughs> all right? But uh, seriously. So what's the game? Um, the game is essentially, it's an RPG, uh, Adventures on the Dying World. So planetary romance tabletop. So we're talking, yeah, yeah, right. So it's it's something that's under the license of John Carter of Mars. So we're just talking great game setting with, hey, you're a human. Now you're on Mars. There's monster stuff going on. And are you the chosen one, or do you live under the seven words of you are already doing the right thing? But not very many superpowers. You know, not very many, there's not much magic, although, of course, there is magic, but it's not as prevalent as, say, D&D. &D. Okay. Okay, so it's it's a very grounded adventure, as grounded as you can on a different planet. But, yeah, so a very grounded adventure. Just kind of very meat and potatoes. We're off to adventure, but getting hit by a rock can still kill you kind of thing. So that that's one of the things I'm looking forward to. Um, it, it was crowdfunded, so, you know, so a crowdfunded game. Um, it was on, um, um, it, it's, it's brought out 
by Morpheus Games. Matter of fact, at the time of the recording, it should still be up on Kickstarter. So we'll see if that comes in. And yeah, so what's your number four? Uh, my number four is also uh, existing because of a intellectual property, um, specifically the idea of Bob Ross. Uh, so I, I've, one of the voice acting gigs that I've gotten was for a game called Smite. Um, I voice Bob acted Bob Ross. Ross. Yes. So the what? It, it's a game where you just take all your oh. little, all wait, your wait, little roles there. and I'll turn them there. into trees? So, um, There's no such I, thing voiced... as a botch role. You're just going <laughs> to turn those into trees. I voiced um, Bob Ross Sylvanas for the game Smite. Mm -hmm. And so I got to do all of these screaming attack orders just really, really calmly. But because of that, <laughs> people have started giving me gifts of, like, for Christmas, I got Bob Ross, The Art of Chill. That is the name of this game. It includes 30 actual Bob Ross paintings. And the thing is, you're supposed to paint alongside Bob Ross. But it's uh, more of a resources game. I, I, I put this on my list and had not played it yet. I'd been right. given it. I had not had a chance to play it since I put this on my list. I have now played it, mm -hmm. and it is actually really fun. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I thought it was going to be like this joke thing that, oh, look, somebody gave me a Bob Ross something. Yay. No, it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, reminds me a lot of Ticket to Ride, mm -hmm. um, where you need to get resources. You need to get uh, each painting has three items on it, whether it be the cozy cabin, the majestic mountains, the fluffy clouds, or the happy little trees. Oh, okay. Each painting has three of these items on it, and it tells you what colors you should use. And the thing is, is those colors are actually what were used to paint that paint that portion of that painting. Oh. So the water is different colors in every painting because the water in that painting is a different color than it is in the previous painting. Okay, so now so, you're saying, all right, I, for my next turn, I'm going to need some platinum white so and you, some burnt And they umber. are. They're, they're <laughs> all, you know, cadmium, uh, with cadmium orange, sap green, um, <laughs> follow blue. Uh, anyway, so you've got the colors, and on the other half of the card is a different kind of brush. So whether it be a palette knife or a fan ah. brush, or a, what it's, so you need, and you have a palette, and you need to add the paint colors to your palette to paint the item, while you then also need the knife or the uh, the brush gotcha. that will paint that item. And then if you're the first person to paint it, you get a point for each color in the painting thing. And then a point or two points for being the first one to paint it. And then if you paint it before Bob Ross, you may get because as you roll every turn, Bob Ross is trying to paint the painting too. Oh. <laughs> and so he will pass the mountains. And if he passes the mountains, before you paint the mountains, then he's already painted them and you don't get the bonus for painting them before him. Oh. And whoever finishes all three items, whether it's Bob Ross or one of the players, you then change the painting. So you may have paint on your palette that you were going to use on that, but now it's changed paintings. Gotcha. And the whole point is you get the chill points, and once you get to 30 chill points, you win. Ah, well, sounds like it's a kind of game where even if you don't exactly win, you can always come out with something well, beautiful. As an artist... You really have to have fun, because that's the point of artistry. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that's my that's my number four. All right. That actually that that actually if you didn't live an hour away, I would probably be like, you know, I, I'm having a rough day. Let's let's turn my rough day into in, into some nice mountains. There's quotes on everyone in the Bob Ross deck. Of there's a deck are. of cards of Bob Ross. There's of course there are. So um, and I'll bring it down sometime. We'll play. All right. Um, well, what's your three? My or no, what's your four? My number four. All I have to say is here we belong, fighting to survive in a world with a terrible lyric. Highlander. Um, Highlander, <laughs> the board game. It comes with, uh, and this is based on Highlander, the motion picture, although it has a lot, um, some other stuff having to do with the Highlander franchise and properties. So, man, that pre quickening thing. changing. Yes, yes, okay. pre quickening changing. Um, yeah, over here, I mean, the, it comes with little miniatures. I'm looking at the Kurgan, Connor, and Ramirez. Um, and of course, who dies is, halfway through the game? <laughs> of, oh, they always do. Um, and, <laughs> Are the heads removable on the figures? No, it's, dude, they're oh. not. They're not that. 
But you, oh, dude, hello. Just retractable. I, just for, I, like a little switch in the back. That I do miniatures. I can always freaking <laughs> saw them off, drill them, and pin them. I mean, it's not a big thing. But um, but again, it's play through the board game of being an immortal and doing the quickening thing. And, you know, I don't want to do a commercial for the whole thing of, ah, there can be only one because I don't have my skull helmet with me. <laughs> um, I put those away a long time ago. But yeah, and I, I still he need to get flowers. <laughs> Shut up. No, I, you know I put away all the combat stuff. I'm <laughs> I'm full I'm full fledged wizard now. But um but yeah, so wizards awesome thing. Wizards can wear skull helmets. Hmm? Wizards can wear skull helmets. Necromancers <laughs> can wear skull helmets. <laughs> they are wizards. Once you put on the no. They fall under the wizard category. Once you put on the skull helmet, <laughs> you are a lich, you're an arc mage, you're a dark mage, you are no longer a wizard. We get pointy hats. A couple of staves, and we have to make friends with people, you know. <laughs> Once you put on the skull hat, then comes the floating castle, then people begin to disobey you, and it's nothing but work, work, work all the time. But um, but this is um, up to five-player board game, which is kind of awesome, because I think in the um, in the art, they actually gave us um, what looks like Fazir and Castigear, hopefully. And Castigear, of course, was the Moor. Fazir was the Frenchman who got killed in the very first scene of the very first movie. Um, and again, it, it's getting the quickening and doing all that jazz. And again, it's on Kickstarter. Um, you know, do I have a problem? No. I can stop Kickstarter <laughs> before I want to because I'm broke. <laughs> I got other stuff to spend money on. But yeah, so, but again, because of my good friend and gaming mentor, Norm, from the, um, from the Blood of Kings podcast, I think you've met Norm once or twice over the years, um, biggest Highlander fan I've ever met, so I bet dollars to donuts that he's going to get the thing and we're going to have a day of, you know, a mountain of Dr. Pepper and freaking playing the Highlander board game and maybe watching, you know, the first movie and <laughs> one or two chosen episodes of the TV series. So yeah, it, it, it's again, it's a nerd thing, kind of, kind of that thing. Can't, so. can't fault you for that. Yeah. So yeah, that that that's what we got on that. Um, again, uh, been a fan of Highlander since it came out in the '80s. So that's that's my old man talking. Um, so what is your number three? Well, I was back and forth on this. Um, it's a game I've played once with the one, one I decided to put in three as opposed to two. Um. Uh, RPG that I had a lot of fun playing called Masks. Uh, it's by Magpie Games. You told me about this one once. I had such fun. I did a, a one-off for the Happy Jacks podcast mm -hmm. on uh, on uh, International Games Day. and Oh, some just got plugged in. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding. 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 <laughs> but, um... Uh, no, I just I, I really enjoyed playing that game so much. Uh, I like the fact that it, it is very, very, um, uh, it's very, very role play driven. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the actions are just roll to see if you do something, and then you have to describe what that action is. It's not as as closed parameters as a lot of the games get. Even your powers, you kind of with the game master determine exactly how your powers work. Yeah. Uh, the, the game is teenage superheroes. Um, like the, we, the ones that are starting out. They're not even yet really sidekicks. They're, they're getting their start. And you actually, they become a team. Everyone is Jubilee from the X-Men. Everyone! Well, remember, <laughs> every version of the X-Men had a different X-Men that introduced okay. you to them. Because okay. the very first one, you had Kitty Pryde. And Dazzler. You had, and, yeah. Yeah, and you had uh, Rogue in the movies. And you had every, every time, they've had a different person who leads you in. But in this, um, all of you are playing teenage superheroes. But the character creation includes describing your relationships a bit more than a lot of other games do. Okay. Um, you, you give influence to people if you specifically respect them. And so you have to kind of define why you respect that person and why you're giving them influence. And then each person has a question that essentially describes the previous encounter, the one that'd be game zero. Okay. Because some fight brought you all together. So if you were playing, it's all based on whichever playbook you choose. Each playbook has a question that they get to answer. And so one of the questions, one of the first ones is, who were you fighting when you all met? Right. And so one person will pick somebody and that's the person you were fighting. And then somebody else will be like, all right, but something tragic happened in that fight. 
they get to define what that tragic item was. Nice. And then somebody else gets to say, but some major superhero <laughs> showed up and they get to do it. So right. each person has a handle on one aspect of that story that you kind of all collectively create. And that starts a lot of your relationships and who you are and everything. And the, the, the templates are very, very loose, again, in determining your powers. Um, my character, I got to create a character that uh, essentially had the ability of mimicking elements, which was one of the abilities you had. But it also had one called free move, and so I basically asked the, G, the, I asked the GM, um, how about if when I take the element form of something that I can then move through that element? Right. Okay. So that, it, that's the, the adaptability that it has. I was able to define that. That wasn't one of the powers listed, but because it fit within the parameters and he came up with some ways of making it not overpowered, that became my ability. Okay. Um, and then at the end of the game experience and even points within the game are awarded some by the GM, but some by other people. There are questions that you have to ask every person in the game. And depending on their answer is whether you get this version of experience or this version of experience. Uh, I'm a big fan of that, actually. And every roll, if you fail it, you get an experience point. <laughs> nice. You learn from failure. And so you could be doing horribly because, oh my gosh, this character wasn't well designed, but you're going to get XP faster so that you can fix those problems. Okay. And that, that's, a, that's a nice way that'll lead into a different segment. Um, you're going to be disappointed in my number three. Uh oh. Yeah. Yeah. Specifically disappointed. The game I'm Sharknado, going to. Sharknado, the board game. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, but that's, that would just evolve I'm into sure me. It's a thing. And if it's not. Don't you dare be the one to make it. That's just me turning on the air conditioner onto high and then throwing gummy sharks at people saying, I'm playing a board game. Um, but no, no, you're going to be disappointed with me because my number three is the Dresden Files build your deck card game. Why am I going to be disappointed with you? You bought it for I me. I know. Why would you, I be disappointed? It was a gift to you. I know, but you gave it to me almost seven months ago and I still haven't even had the time to open the damn thing so this year sometime I am going to open and read the rule book to that game and I'm going to play that game even if I have to, even if we have to do it on camera as a show we are going I am going to play that game I am perfectly fine with it. I've played it a couple of times okay I enjoy it um, I think it's extremely hard Okay. Um, it comes with a built-in uh, difficulty. And unfortunately, I feel like the easiest difficulty is too hard for most beginning gamers. Ah, oh, well, And that's... I think that, that that doesn't... If you're going to do that, make the medium, you know, for average gamers and the difficult for gamers who really want to challenge. But you should have an intro level where people can still have a chance to win. And it's really not unless you're really on top of your game okay and have a lot of luck um so kind of like being harry dresden in the novels True. True. <laughs> so at least they got that part so yeah um what's your number two my number two uh is i i've loved the series and this is one that is coming out this year bum, and I, bum, I loved the bah. series i'm gonna say i love both the game that it's that this series is coming with and the series that they're making a skin for this game um i've loved flux for years by looney labs um and uh flux is creating a doctor who version ah uh, here we go and I'm a, <laughs> I'm a big fan of doctor who have been for since the fourth doctor came on pbs back in the back early in the 80s days. yeah um, and uh, I, I i've been a fan of the new series capaldi was not my favorite but I, I think he especially did well toward the last season. I'm looking forward to the new one. I have made no decision of whether I'm happy or sad that it's a woman. Well, I'm she looks see what good. They do. Yeah, she looks good. But I, the everything... suspenders are a little Mork and Mindy. <laughs> but I'm going to see how they play that. I'm going well, to keep an open mind and see what it is. Um, well, again, Flu um, Doctor Who Flux, I, I should have known. Um, don't want to get into a big discussion about the next season of Doctor Who. All I'm going to say is... With Doctor Who, the actor is always good. I don't care who you like or who you didn't. The actor is always good. But what stories the actor who was playing the Doctor is put in and what the companions mean will determine whether or not we have good quality story and bad quality story. So as far as next season goes, 
I hope she gets some good scripts. I, 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 that that's what I'm going to say. I will only add one thing, and then we'll get back to Flux. Mm-hmm. Um, is yes, every actor has been good. That is not an automatic that whoever they're putting in it is good or is right for uh, the role. Uh, it, I don't it's think that's really a given. open. <laughs> I don't think it's a given. They can still do it poorly. They okay. can come out and decide that Doctor Who in this variation speaks in a high squeaky voice. And I'm going to not probably like that. <laughs> I'm not saying that's a choice she's going to make, but it is possible. It's true. Not every actor is automatically good. I have a feeling this actress is good. And so I'm open to see what she does with it. And yes, the stories are going to be a big portion of it. I think Capaldi's big uh, challenge yeah. was his partner for the first. Oh, yeah. And Clara yeah. was not my favorite companion. And, and some people, some of you guys freaking love her and you're welcome to. But I'm a pond guy. Hey, I'm I'm one of the people that didn't like Rose or Sarah Jane. So, um, yeah. And and I've been a Hoovian longer than most of y'all. <laughs> but, um, but back to but Flux. Yeah. yeah, back to Flux. I'm it's, really looking forward to I love uh, if you I never can, played Flux. I can see Flux, that. Well, Flux um, is one of... Um, I like to say that Flux is, has always been the great in-between game games. For like if, you, if you're having friends over and you guys are going to be playing different board games or miniatures games or whatever all day. Like you Magic the Gathering players out there. <laughs> you get two or three games of Magic the Gathering. You throw in a Flux game in between just to cleanse your palate and to stay in the mood for playing games so you don't get burnt out. And Flux has always been great for that. Well, they've Always. also done a great job of the different skins having some different flavor to it yeah. that isn't just the same game. Like, I, I love the concept and, and at, at some point even wanted to collect all the monopolies for the different versions yeah. that I draw. But that is the same game. Yeah. Y- yes, whether Boardwalk is Boardwalk or, oh, we're playing Batmanopoly, so it's, it's Arkham Wayne Asylum Manor or, or Wayne Manor. Yeah. You know, like, those mm-hmm. are, yeah, that, that's just the same thing with a different name. Yeah. In Flux, each game has been It feels different. different. Yeah, it feels different. The um, Batman Flux, as a matter of fact, has been the quickest games and, because you can win with the villains sometimes. And there's yeah. more villains, more Again, uh, um, creepers. The Hobbit collects all the um, Flux games as well. And it was funny because when we were in Texas, we picked up my two favorite Flux of the iteration. Nerd alert, nerd alert, nerd alert. Math and science Flux. <laughs> so, no, I like those. I and like chemistry those. Flux was awesome. Awesome. I'm like, haha, I know the periodic table of elements better than the rest of you guys. So, <laughs> you know, um, okay. I still, I've got a special place in my heart for Monty Python Flux. Okay. It was well, the first of course one you I actually owned. I'm a huge Monty Python fan. So it, but I also liked that like, my, my wife and I were on a, uh, a, the boat to Catalina. Okay. And we're playing it at a table and the looks we're getting because we're singing the songs because you get to draw an extra card if you sing a song. Right. Um, we're, we're quoting things. We're talking in silly British accents and just the looks. We loved it. We had no <laughs> problem with the fact that people were looking at us like we were crazy. But the, uh, the idea of Flux, for those of you who've never played it, there is no way to win at the very beginning of the game. Nope. The way to win is going to be presented. It's going to be played as a goal. And how you win will change or fluctuate. If you will. Where the name came from. Um, <laughs> but uh, it'll fluc- fluctuate. Uh, so different, you may be working towards one goal, but then somebody replaces that with another one. And now, oh, I have to change my plan. Yeah. Oh, that was killing me with math flux. It re- I'm like, okay, all I have to do is come up with an equation that equals zero. Now I have to come up with an equation that equals 37. Screw you, honey. You know, um, all right. Now, my, my number two, mm-hmm. my number two is a new one again on Kickstarter. Okay, maybe I do have a problem. Uh, and it's called Nightcrawl. Okay. Okay. It is an RPG because I love me some RPGs. And it's a system that I haven't seen before, which is I tend to game with people who either play the exact same game every time or they play systems that they know they break the systems so that every character is min max twink yeah. and they can win everything. I love them, but the I guess you could say spirit of the setting always gets lost because they play the same five characters. Um, but this one is me. It's all me. It is again not very much magic, but just just enough to remind you that it's a fantasy game. But it's film noir. So, okay. yeah, so we're talking in the spirit of the Sam Spade novels, um, you know, Maltese Falcon or Sunset Boulevard. So we're talking um, racist epitaphs, <laughs> um, trench coats, fedoras, um, leather bottom shoes. So does the magic come out of the racist epitaphs? 
that's the only reason I can imagine that they're still around in 2018. Come on, people. Um, but yeah, uh, so so yeah, so think like very L.A. Noir, the video game, or okay. stuff like that, and uh, the Who Framed Roger Rabbit type thing. So you know, the gritty, dark. You have a 38 type thing. There's an RPG that needs to exist. Who Framed Roger Rabbit? You can roll as either a human or a tune. Get to writing. <laughs> get to writing. Oh, that takes Disney. That's that's going to require so many lawyers just to get that that idea out there. That's and why we don't have it yet. <laughs> even worse, it'll also take Warner Brothers. What do you mean even worse? Warner Brothers is quick. No, no, Actually, what I'm no, saying not, is you're going to have to get them to talk to each other. Oh, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> never mind. Yeah. Not after the Justice League movie. It's not just they're both going to talk to you. They're going to have to talk to each other. Yeah, because Looney Tunes versus, uh, or the Merry Melodies versus the Sweet Symphonies. and the, Oh, man. I worked at the Disney stores as my, my teenage job, and uh, and they had a watch right after uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out. Best friggin' watch. It was uh, Jessica Rabbit sitting, and her leg ticked the seconds. Okay. So her legs were crossed and her leg ticked the seconds. And I was there the day that we had to pull them all off the shelves because Warner Brothers had reminded Disney that that was a Warner Brothers drawn and Jessica character. Rabbit is ours. Yeah, exactly. So it got pulled. I didn't get we a got chance Jessica, to buy one we before got it Betty. went out there. Yeah. <laughs> you know. so those you can probably those. find it on eBay for the cost of a mortgage payment. Yeah, no, I, I don't need to watch that badly. <laughs> I, I've gone pocket watch at this yeah. point. Yeah, that, it's very true. So what's your number one? Number, number one. one. Again, I wrote this uh, uh, before um, this past weekend, uh, and it was on my list because I was looking forward to getting back in the game. I hadn't played it for six months. It is currently my favorite RPG to play. Um, and uh, I was in a game of it. This was the third time I've been playing in this particular game of it. And uh, I had to miss six months worth of the game. I went back this weekend. Star Wars, we're talking the Fantasy Flight version of the game. Oh, my With a new God. die system. Um, and I'm a huge fan of how this system worked out. Okay. Um, the roles with the uh, successes and uh, failures versus... Um, uh, advantages and disadvantages and then you have triumphs and uh dis i forget the name of the the counter so triumph a very granular method of success and failure well so. but the idea is it almost makes it cinematic as i keep describing it because okay. um you can succeed but have so many disadvantages that while you were tr what you were trying to do worked Something else went horribly awry, which just feels very much like Han Solo. Like, yeah, we're all fine here. How are you? Most he epic successfully bluff. worked the radio, yeah, but did not successfully Most, talk yeah. to the person. Most epic bluff check, <laughs> bluff fail in cinematic history. <laughs> but um, and then the the uh, triumph can have a major success. Mm -hmm. So even if you didn't succeed at what you did something amazing happens and the GM gets to decide whether or not that works for you or not. Yeah, like your torpedoes going in the exhaust port and the Death Star blowing up and, you know, Carrie Fisher giving you um a really cool medallion and making you wonder what she's going to look like in a bikini in five years. Well, um, and now this time around is the first time I'm playing a Jedi. Okay. Um, and they, I have noted that they've kind of done it so that every character that you could play has a Jedi version of it. Okay. So you can play a mechanic, or you can play a Jedi mechanic. You can play a pilot, or you can play a Jedi pilot. You can play, like, so they- Jedi or Force user? Uh, force user, but they're they're really written as versions of Jedi. Okay. Um, they don't have the concept of gray Jedi in it, and once you become a Sith, you really become something, unless you're playing an all Sith, game right. you become an npc at that point okay so if you go that far dark side usually the gm will take over your it's like turning into decisions. a demon in nominee all right yes. um well my number one game <clears throat> this is a game that i have been shilling and whoring over um since 2002 okay so we're we're going way back old school old school from back in the days where you and i used to play munchkin once a week okay um, and this is called When Darkness Comes, The Awakening from Twilight Creations. It is a variable tile board game, and I love me some variable tiles. Now, Twilight Creations is most known for the Zombies board game, 
or zombies, I would scream it, but I don't feel like it, but it's got three exclamation points. And um, one of the things, because of the people I play game games with, is they game the game. So any set of randomness, anything that makes it so that you can't guess, like you can't go into the game with a strategy before we start playing is huge for me. And um, zombies, of course, won everybody over because of the variable tile aspect. But when darkness comes is them expanding on the variable tile. Okay. And um, it is a variable tile board game, except it pushes that line to role playing game. Um, what was it? Arkham Horror, I believe, is very much like it. And this is like a proto version. Um, but you get to create your own character, number one. And that's huge. Um, yeah, because I've played games like Arkham Horror and stuff like that, and they've got templates or uh, right. a trail on a House of the Hill. Exactly. And um, they have templates, and in When Darkness Comes, you have the pre-generated characters, but you also have rules for creating your own character. Okay. Um, magic is not a thing, but it's very Lovecraftian plus Universal Monster movie. But the whole premise is you're in a town, strange stuff starts a happening, and you can either figure out how to stop the strange stuff of happening or try and get your butt out of town. But um, I've had this game for years and I generally play it alone. And that's why it's at the number one of my list because by my rod and staff, I will play this game with other people <laughs> because um, it is very suspenseful. The monsters are not easy to easy to take down. It's got um, NPCs um, in one of the, and it's got, um, it comes with a scenario book that has four different um, modules and then it expands over five expansions to a great big hellmouth Buffy the Vampire Slayer into the world scenario. But you never get superpowers. You might learn a little magic, but there's things like I finally got a crowbar so I get a bonus to my attack. But this monster um, this monster requires um, a three straight die roll, but my attack power is only two dice. So I might just have to run. And it has mechanics for locking doors. You know, okay. and as a black dude that grew up watching horror movies, I'm like, why don't they ever lock the door behind them? But it isn't zombies, so it's not a horror, but you get looking backwards. That was always my thing. Um, because stupid. So um, the concept of the game always got me. It was always fun. It's just the rule book is written in a way that only an occultist can understand. But I like to um, I like to call it a nice intro into RPGs because it's um it's very related to our next segment <laughs> um but it's got very much that okay you're doing a role-playing game and not every role-playing has to be superhero or fantasy but this is you build a person that has a job that's living a life and this happens now what and um i'm sure you're noticing a trend in my 2018 stuff which is as much as i love superheroes i'm not having a good time finding people to play with as far as that stuff goes because most of my friends have been beaten down by real life and they don't want they don't like ideas of gods that actually like you or powerful people that don't become villains so i'm like okay if we're gonna bring stuff down to street level we'll bring it down to street level so i'm doing a lot of street level stuff but i'm throwing a whole bunch of stuff at people that yeah okay you can be street level if you want to have monsters have real monsters you know so um so that that that's where i'm going with that and when darkness comes and arkham horror and stuff like that those fit the genres but i never thought darkness got a fair shake from twilight creations and um well not from twilight creations because they did four expansions but you know there's no youtube video playthroughs of this game hmm Seriously, and I look well, almost every day. Hey, and we'll be the first. Yeah, exacto mundo. So that is that is what I'm looking at, and um, I'm looking real forward to playing it because it has suspense, especially in the you create your own character sense. But yeah, if you go in going, I'm a big power fantasy guy, you're gonna lose your character, and it's like, wait, this isn't fair. The monsters are monstrous. Yeah, they're monster. Look. If there were three feral cats actually going for your jugular, you're telling me that you would be cool-headed? Because 
having been Monty Python by my ex roommate's rabbit, <laughs> um, I can let you know when stuff gets real, <clears throat> things get a little odd. Well, and even in those movies, the movies that were like that, people ran for the first, you know, three quarters of the movie, and then they figured out how to beat it, and then they went back and faced it because running away for some reason in the movie was not an option. Right. Something happened that said, you're not going to get away. Yeah. All right. Here's the book that you finally have stumbled across that has the how to beat it. Yeah. Can you? Exactly. And that so that's the kind of thing I'm looking forward to. I'm, I'm getting more into these ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. If for no other reason to tell my friends that are haters that there's a reason I like extraordinary and super extraordinary. Because it's like, yeah, that's and, and military training. And I'm like, oh, shut up. Just just, just shut up. Not everybody can be an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And <laughs> I refuse to, I honestly refuse to limit my imagination to the top of what modern technology can give us today. You know, that, that's just what I'm saying. So yeah, everybody, there, there's our top five. Um, but as I said, it tied into our second, our next segment. And um, for our next segment, I wanted to talk about gaming myths. Okay, um, gaming myths and... Um, well, one or two myths in particular. One has to do with the video game, or the not the video game, but the game we're talking about in our final segment. But um, the big the big myth um, that we've learned in role in role playing games on tabletop tabletop role playing games that one company tried to live by and got their teeth kicked in because of it, and that is game balance and the perceived importance of game balance in RPGs. Yeah, balance is something that, you know, you want everybody to have a chance to enjoy themselves. And some people think that that means that everybody has to have the exact same chance of success at everything. Yeah, and um, there's there's been a lot of questions, and this actually ties into um, one of the policies here at Back in the Deck, which is... um. We talk about role playing games, but this is the 21st century. So most when when most people hear role playing games, they immediately think WoW or Dragon Age or um, those are RPGs. Hmm? They are. They are MMOs. It, unless you're MMO playing on an RPG RP server. Yeah. Unless you're playing on an RP server. Massive it multiplayer. Is just an MMO. Yeah, but if you are not playing it on an RP server, you're playing an MMO. Right, but most of the time, you know, you say RPG and people go straight to video yes. games, forgetting about us das rollers cuz we were the first gamers. But we've lost the title of gamer, but you know, still it's we're out there, we got our thing. Um, first modern gamer. I'm going to give the Egyptians first gamers. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. Um, and looking about, I was talking to one of our um, article writers about, you know, the differences, because he is a long time, like, second edition D&D, &D, kind of a purist, kind of a, you know. But he was telling me um, he was stationed in Afghanistan, fell out of stuff. Um, but when he was in Afghanistan, or came back, he got into an RPG group, and they were playing 4th edition D&D. &D. That's very balanced um, and too balanced mm -hmm. in the sense of this level character should be able to take this level threat regardless of their class. Well, no, it goes beyond that even. Because, you know, when you're playing, it's, it's very much like WoW in that, okay, so you're going to hit two, and then you're going to hit three, three times, and then you're going to hit four, and you're going to keep doing that pattern until the bar fills up, and then you hit six for your final ultimate move. Mm. You know, I, when I was playing in a game uh, of fourth edition, the GM is phenomenal, but this particular system never spoke to me because when I was playing it, I wanted to play a, a druid. Okay. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And, and, and I had my whole character concept. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to buy a mace. You don't want a mace. No, I do. I want a mace for my character. Your, your character wouldn't use maces. He uses staves. But I don't want to use a mace. At well, least that, a club. Not, druids don't use maces. Okay. Well, but I want to play a druid who uses a mace. How about that? <laughs> like, all the options are kind of taken away from you. Okay. And it's made very streamlined, so anybody who doesn't play role-playing games a lot, you don't have to do a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. But that's what I live for in role-playing games, is 
you know, board games, I enjoy them. Card games, I enjoy them. But there's always a structure to them. Role-playing games are the, I feel like checking out the car. And the GM going, well, I didn't really plan what was in the car. <laughs> I didn't know anybody was going to look at the car. I remember a game a friend of mine played where he had uh, a ship crashed on Earth. <laughs> and they got on the ship and had a whole bunch of roles where they were trying to take off. He had a whole adventure for them on Earth. They managed to roll well enough that they got the ship into <laughs> orbit. And he's like, all right, well, games now cancel or games called until I've had some time to look up <laughs> spell jammer rules and see what I'm going to throw at you I, guys now. Yeah, I now need to write a space adventure. Thanks, guys. Um, but I love that aspect of it. Well, yeah, it's my, my big thing is the whole idea of a level playing field. Now, I don't want to get on my big horse, but life don't start at a level playing field. All right. And one of the things that I've always dug, like I listen to the complaints about 3.5. Oh, my God, it's so off balance. And I'm like, yeah, and it should be because, um, again, in 3.5 and again, these ain't spoilers because Pathfinder has been out for what, 10 years? And Pathfinder was the last big thing to happen during the 3.5 years. And I love the open gaming license of 3.5. So you got the D&D books and you can get settings and monsters from everywhere. Some overpowered, some underpowered, whatever. That's a whole nother episode. But um, dealing with 3.5, yeah, guess what? If you were a 20th level cleric, you did win. I mean, you essentially won because... At the end of the day, a 20th level priest can call on the power of the gods they serve. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what role playing system you have, what freaking narrative you run. If you have what we in Western society would refer to as gods on speed dial, willing to do what you ask them to do, that actually means that, well, let's face it. I don't care if you're the best dude with a sword ever. You're going to have a hard time against the dude that calls God. If you don't believe me, ask Ramses about his freaking adopted brother. Okay. I mean, you know, there is, you could have all the soldiers in the world, but at level 20, you are a biblical freaking prophet. And yeah. the thing was in the beginning of the game, the characters that would attend ascend to that level of godhood that had that level of magic or those levels of priest honestly were lucky if they made it to level five because they had low hit points they couldn't fight very well and the beginning of most adventures the grinding part if you will you get attacked by stuff all the time so if you were a first level wizard you could be killed by a freaking wildcat in the dark during the freaking sleeping thing. And if there wasn't a high enough level cleric to resurrect you, that's it. That was your whole character. So the floating castle in the sky and your ability to throw a hundred freaking fireballs was your reward for living through all those levels of you suck. And yeah, so I mean, now it's a first level wizard is a match for a first level fighter. I yeah I There's don't also really get something it. That's happened not just in in uh, fantasy based role playing games, but all role playing games across the board, that uh, people don't necessarily want to look into the other aspects of a role playing game. They mm. look at its fighting capabilities. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, and if it can't fight as well, why am I playing this character? Yeah, and, and I've been in many games where the person who who rolled the fighter doesn't know how to play until we get in combat. Like they'll right. sit there, they'll they'll like basically they'll be on Facebook problems, all day. Yeah. Or they'll cause problems for the GM by doing stupid things because they think it's funny until oh, a combat starts. Those guys. Yeah. And, and the thing is is that the role playing aspect of it, the you know, subversion aspect of it, the theft aspect of it. The, right. You know, whatever the, all the other side parts of the story that's where you know the other characters get their chance to shine a right. rogue is not you know they may get a backstab in there but they're not going to get the attacks in especially in the early parts oh yeah that a fighter is going to get in 
Right. But you but know what that fighter is going to open the chest. Exactly. It's going to disarm the trap that saves everybody. Yeah, exactly. You the know, wizard is, is gonna going to be your to... research person for the first part of the game. Yeah. They're the you ones that identify the magical up. article uh, items. They're the ones who can see if the booby trap that you're about to send the thief in to do is a magic trap, you know, and having this aspect of it's all about the fight loses something because, um, again, I think it's I think it's a sign of the 21st century in the sense of when you're playing an RPG on a console or on a computer. OK, the narrative is there. The NPCs are there and it is optional. But if you just feel like fighting all the time and you don't even want to do the story aspect, sandbox games are notorious for this, be it um, um, Grand Theft Auto or Assassin's Creed or um, um dragon age you know or one of my favorites dark souls um if you're trying to go for the narrative yeah fighting is the only way to get leveled you know fighting is the only way to improve but in most rpgs there's so many other ways to grow and i think a lot of the gamers of generations after ours because we're now into um y millennials and z's um and they're they're not quite seeing the aspect of there are ways to get better and ways to be good that don't just involve punching your way through a problem. So, um, now that said, I think there are problems from back then that uh, have been addressed in some. For instance, I was a big fan of Shadowrun. Okay. However, as soon as you go into the computer, everybody else sits <laughs> around for an hour. Yep. Um, and this is one of the areas where, you know, I mentioned the Fantasy Flight Star Wars game. I was really thrilled with what they did with space combat. Okay. Mm, because you have a pilot. And your pilot's main job is flying things. So when you're in a gun shootout, the pilot does it, he's probably not your best gunner. <laughs> he's not killing people in one shot. Right. So he needs to wait for that piloting moment to right. be able to really shine. Or do some sort of secondary skill that would help, like hiding or, but in, you know. But when you get to that, if nobody else can do anything because you're sitting on a ship and really the pilot, you got one person maybe running a gun and that, but you didn't take gunner, they, they wrote into the rules things that you can do other than that. So like a slicer can hack the other ship and reduce their shields. Okay. Possibly shut off their, their, uh, um, their guns. Oh, okay. The a leadership type character can boost the morale, giving everybody else bonuses on their role. Yeah, um, as in they're somebody, telling them what to do. Like you give it a task. You the know, the engineers can run around and fix the ship while you're in combat. So you're doing emergency repairs while you're getting hit. You know, that sounds amazingly like Star Wars is learning something from Star Trek. Um, <laughs> Not to like do one fandom better than another, but I'm just saying they learn from each other. Um, and honestly, I would, I would put forward though I don't think uh, that the Star Trek RPG mm -hmm. has that much balance. No, for for and that's what I'm saying. I think they were. I don't think they're the first to do it, but they definitely whoever they got it from, or if they are the first, hey, bravo. Mm -hmm. But um, they they decided that we're not going to have a portion of the game where one person sits to the side or where where everybody sits to the side. Well, one, and person, one person shines. Plays. Yeah. But there are going to be times where one person sits to the side because mm -hmm. whatever the group is doing is not that person's forte. Right. If you're trying to get information out of a, a you know thug you've captured, and you're the paladin. You're not going to be a part of that interrogation. Especially not if there's an inquisitor in your party, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's aspects of every character and uh, having a moment to shine. And that also falls to the GM to give. So if you have certain characters, have your story based in giving each of those characters a chance to really be a part of the puzzle. Yeah. So that's that's a really big thing. Um Hit us up in the comments. Let's keep this conversation going on all those other mediums I mentioned because, um, again, I prefer having imbalance in the world because if you survive the world and you ascend to godhood, there seems to be a real accomplishment there. But at the same time, I'm the same dude that plays a lawful good character in a Ravenloft campaign. <laughs> and, um, you know, not to screw the party over, but it, it's really just a matter of can I stay lawful good um, can I actually help people in this scape of hell? You know, it, it's it's that kind of thing. Um, 
But the other myth I wanted to get to is specifically tied into one game. One, and it's, it's a myth that I don't actually believe, basically because I'm so familiar with the IP that I wanted to clear up some stuff. And I've been watching some stuff from a dude named um, Seth Sarkowski. Mm -hmm. And he is the most enthusiastic and regular um, runner of the game that this segment is about called The Call of Cthulhu. Um, there is one common misconception with Call of Cthulhu, which is a role-playing game that uses the percentage dice system, and I, I kind of like that. But um, it really comes down to talk to any gamer that's been gaming for more than five years or who's played a game of Call of Cthulhu. And the misconception is every single adventure, if not session, should end with the entire party going insane or dying. And um, he brought up a point that I did some research on as well, which is if you look into the modules, a lot of the modules are, se are sequels to previous modules. So if the characters are supposed to go insane and or die <laughs> in between games, yeah, why, why are there sequels going on? And the answer is because that misconception is incorrect from the onset. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I have read H.P. Lovecraft. I've read a lot of the authors that picked up the Cthulhu mythos after. And going insane is a logical conclusion to a lot of the stuff that goes on when you deal with old ones in deep time. But um, I don't like to treat it as an eventuality, at least not in the sense that a lot of gamers look at crazy. Because when people go insane in games, they go two styles the warner brothers and the warner sister yakko wacko and dot <laughs> or Gollum. <laughs> it oh, no gracious. nowhere in between just freaking feces slinging stomach holding rocking back and forth things that are saying non sequitur statements or um annoying six-year-old on too much sugar and um I don't really dig that. Catatonic is probably going to be the most common. No, uh, no, honestly, because catatonic, it's hard to role play. No, I'm you... just saying, if if madness was going to onset in these moments, I'm saying catatonic in that state would be it, it, pretty it's, frequent. Well, catatonic is one of them, but here's one of the big things. In third edition Call of Cthulhu to present, <clears throat> there is an entire lexicon of phobias. They give like over 110 different phobias with their names. And if there's that many ways to be afraid of something, there's got to be more than two or three ways to be crazy. You know, especially since sanity is something that can be restored, <laughs> you know, and um, in game, you mm -hmm. can you can restore mm -hmm. your sanity points in game. It's just a matter of this preconceived notion of I want to play this game and out, you know, um, one of the jokes with my group and um, Pedro is it's not about surviving. It's about how you die. And I'm like, you know, that doesn't exactly sound fun all the time, which is why I very rarely, if ever, seen a longstanding Call of Cthulhu campaign. So I'm thinking about picking that up after I get through my top five list and actually running something, which is why When Darkness Comes is at the top of my list, because um, the level of threats that you can't punch your way through is a really big thing for me but more to the point um it's easy to die the problem is real and it has to be addressed and nine chances out of ten it's got to be addressed by the player characters because if not then why are we telling the story <laughs> um well it, it actually my thoughts tend to go towards actually a tv series that i was a big fan of monk oh, really because you're talking about having the fears and, the, and yet still having to solve the crime. Yes. He very much had to deal with his neuroses, his fears, his everything. Functioning madness. And that is... I think that's a good example yeah, of it. Um, and he starts to get better by the end of the, yeah. end of the series. I mean, that's... Um, and these are aspects in fiction that we don't really look into, which is why it's... It's easy to dismiss something by just calling the person crazy. But like um, when certain writers address it, it's a big thing. Like example, um, 
This is canon. Look it up if you want to. But as established by the Romita family, you know, John Romita and John Romita Jr., Spider-Man is afraid of heights. Just think about that. Okay, our web slinging, wall crawling, New York skyscraper <laughs> um, crawling up dude that jumps from rooftop to rooftop is actually afraid of heights. And the aspect of overcoming the fears or dealing with those fears in order to do the right thing, or at least what the character considers the right thing, is something that I think a lot of narratives and role playing games could actually explore. And I think Call of Cthulhu was set up very well for that. But um, I see. And along those lines, one of my favorite stories was Storm having to go underground with her with fear. the Morlocks. Yeah. Oh yeah. And her having to fight Callisto. Yeah. And for the being claustrophobic. The, being totally claustrophobic. <laughs> you know. So yeah, and you know, getting over those fears and insanities and things like that. And I think Call of Cthulhu, amongst a few other gaming systems, are perfect for setting up those narratives. Now, don't get me wrong. Having run Call of Cthulhu having been a believer in that myth for, I guess you can say social pressure sake, I've fallen into the trap of how many things could I throw in my players' ways to cost them sanity points. <laughs> you know, it's really easy to say, and you walk through a door, uh, make a perception check. Yeah, one of the screws in the hinges is a little bit off. Make a sanity check. <laughs> I pass my sanity check. Yes, you only lose one. You don't lose five. <laughs> you know, but um, is that a role playing game or is that just um, a sadistic measure of being like, I, I don't know, some petty tyrant. So in my case, it was the tyrant. Um, but I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to run better games. So um, that that's where I sit with that. What's your thought on it? Well, along the same lines as Call of Cthulhu, I, I actually feel similarly for Paranoia. Okay. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, you, sh you shouldn't be able to make it to the end of Paranoia. You're going you're gonna to die. Yes, you're going to die. But they built in the clone concept. <laughs> and your GM shouldn't be sending you on something where you run out of clones frequently. Yeah. Like you should be able to, because, I mean, they've got rules in there for getting to higher clearance levels that if you're supposed to, in the same way that you're talking with the mm -hmm. sequels, if you're supposed to run out of clones every game, then you're never going to get to those higher clearance levels. Exactly. And the game gets so much more interesting at in those... so many different layers. If you get to that clearance level and you're still a secret society person and you're still trying to figure oh, yeah. everything out, you know. Well, we'll we'll talk about paranoia in depth in a different show because I want to draw a parallel between paranoia and Snowpiercer. Um, so we'll 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 get to that. But the, but the but the idea is that I think some of that goes down to how is the GM going to play it, and even with the scenario you were giving mm -hmm. of uh, the screw making somebody lose five <laughs> madness and your tyrant and. Ah, <laughs> Even with that, if you are going to give them the ability to also get that sanity back or give them ways and help them play in ways that they still get to play a madness and have fun doing it, right? then you are being a good GM. So you can throw all those madness points at them as long as you're willing to run a game of people who are dealing with those insanities which you may want to hold off for the first period of time. Yeah. But yeah. eventually that may be where you want the game to go for a period of time. And then something happens that gets them their sanity back. And, no. you know, all of that's an aspect of the roller coaster mm -hmm. that is Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> it should be a roller coaster. It right. It should be the, the threat needs to be real. And right. that's what I think with Call of Cthulhu more than, uh, than a lot of other role playing games is the threat of dying you really have to take into consideration with every action. Yeah, and you want to talk about off balance. Oh my God, yeah, because again, that that's one of the many role-playing games out there where the playing field is not balanced. You as a player start off at a major disadvantage in this world. And I think surviving the campaigns, even going on to a second module, has a really big sense of accomplishment, especially with the emotional connections that we get to a lot of the characters that we make. And... You know, it, it's something that we should explore. But if you guys want to explore that further, feel free um, to talk to us about your experiences with Game Balance or Call of Cthulhu and all that stuff. And um, if you guys have a lot to say that you don't want to put in all the comments, then hit us up at backinthedeck at gmail.com. You can also hit us up on the Twitter. We're going to be paying a lot more attention to the Back in the Deck Twitter as well. You know, 
people sending more tweets, letting you know the other stuff that we're looking at. Um, if you want to send us a video message because you can use, you know, uh, let's face it, it's 21st century. Why not make a little movie of yourself and send it to us at Instagram slash BidP. Um, you can also find us on the YouTubes because, well, that's our number one way of reaching a lot of you new guys. Remember, like, subscribe, share, all that jazz. Um, hit us up on the SoundCloud because, you know, the SoundCloud is where... Um, a lot of this stuff, again, we put all the audio that from all the recordings up there. So if you don't like looking at our faces, but you like listening to what we're talking about, hit us up on the SoundCloud. It's nice and free. You don't have to do any subscribe. Well, subscribing to SoundCloud is good, okay? But you don't have to pay for anything on SoundCloud. As a matter of fact, you can even download our audio tracks from SoundCloud for free. You can download them and listen to them at your leisure, which means if you don't want to hear us at night, download it, put it on your phone, run it through your Bluetooth in your car on your way to work, because if you're in Southern California like we are, you're going to be in traffic for a long time. Uh, Don't set tones of our voices. That's right. Yeah, well, especially when we're doing our Bob Ross impressions. That'll keep you awake behind the wheel. Just grab that driver next to you and beat him up. That's right. But we're going to take that rear ending and we're going to turn it into flowers. That's right. <laughs> there are no mistakes. <laughs> Happy <the> accidents. <laughs> you know, that's like saying there's no road rage. Come the fuck <laughs> on. No, um, and again, you can always join us on Deckers on the book which is an open facebook group so let us know you know leave likes and comments and freaking if you hate what you see on youtube then subscribe and share and talk to us in the comments if you like us then you know hit us up share our stuff all the way around we've got so many mediums that we can reach each other through nowadays when people say i didn't have time to contact you i'm like what you, you couldn't send a text a facebook a freaking a SoundCloud, an email, a freaking private message on the Facebook, a private message on Tinder. You couldn't hit me up on any of these things. You couldn't even send a smoke signal. So, you know, there's no reason to not communicate except for you don't want to and you're too afraid to say so. But I got more faith in you than that. <laughs> I do. I believe that you are better than that. So, yeah, hit us up and remember, um, well, um, if you if you want to specifically reach me, you yeah. can also reach me at dw.bidp at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at bardic underscore dw. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram. I've Woo-hoo! actually been using an Instagram. Yes, you have. I've come into the 21st century. <laughs> um, you, you can find me at dw.bidp. Uh, on Instagram, and I'm also on the, uh, the Deckers on the Book. And I really want to thank you for just picking up the ball and saying how people could get a hold of you. You know the other co-hosts have not even memorized all those emails and Instagrams and Twitter accounts that I made for them on my time and all that other stuff. So yeah, so hey, remember guys, uh, the, the, yeah, DW, he's kind of ahead. I know he's more of a pro and you guys are new, but catch up! So, um, but yeah. You're a pro of this. Well, you know, you're the only person that I'm working with that does podcasts with other people. Um, But with that, I'm going to say if, you know, just remember everybody, if people tell you that you can't like what you like because of your circumstances of birth, heritage, culture, creed, gender identification, whatever, you just tell them to take all those cards and put them back in the deck because what you like is what you like as long as nobody's getting hurt and nobody's hurting any kids. So with that, we are going to say good night, good afternoon, good evening, or whatever. We're Take just going to call care. it a day. Take so care, for now. and we will see you next time on Table Talk on one of our other shows.